Uh, turn to Mark 16 there if you've got that. We're going to look at verse 1 to start with of Mark 16. Mark is a little bit of an unusual book in the way that it ends. We'll get to that in just a second, but I want you to catch that, and I think that, that helps us see something even uh, this morning. So Mark 16, verse 1 says, When the Sabbath was over, Sabbath being the Saturday uh, after the crucifixion, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices and they, so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they've laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And then it just stops. It's the weirdest ending of all four of the Gospels, four biographies of Jesus' life. Mark has always been kind of blunt. He's just straight to, it's the shortest book. He's straight to the point. And he gets this place. He says, the women were told, go out and tell the disciples. They were freaked out, and they just didn't. Why did he tell it that way? They didn't tell anybody, not at first. Other Gospels say that when they got their wits together, they went and told the apostles, the leaders of the church, and they were freaked out and didn't believe it either. Now, if you're writing, if you're just making up a story, I say this in case you're trying to wrestle with faith. If you're just making up a story, this is a man-made book, why in the world would you put those pieces in there? It doesn't make sense. It makes your leaders look really bad. But that's what happened. They were all freaked out. Nobody was expecting it. And it's as if Mark just kind of drops the mic and leaves it there for us, the reader, to wrestle with. What about you, he prompts. What are you going to think about this empty tomb? The women weren't expecting it. The guys weren't expecting it. No one was expecting it. So what about you? What are you going to do with the empty tomb? And that really is the question for today. If you're looking at faith and trying to figure out faith and trying to figure out where you're at in your faith, uh, you can get sidetracked on a lot of different side issues. But this is really the issue. If Jesus came back from the dead, then he's king. And we can wrestle with everything else within the framework of that. But if he didn't, we're all wasting a bunch of time. And the Bible says that very clearly. So that's the key issue for you to wrestle with if you're wrestling with your faith. Now, I love how, if you notice there in, in Mark, it says that some of the earliest manuscripts don't have verses 9 to 20, but some do. I, I read one scholar that suggests that verses 9 to 20 were later added, kind of like Mark's followers put a P.S. on the end of it. Like, oh, Mark, honey, you can't, you can't just end it quickly like that. You've got to add some more details. But that's not the way Mark wanted it. Mark just kind of said, here's the facts. They left. Now, what are you, the reader, going to do? So what are you going to do? You know, we live in interesting times in our culture. Uh, we, we almost, even as religious participation and church attendance is falling off in our country, we almost universally believe that there's more to this life than what we can see, that there's something beyond. You know, go stand near the ocean or stand near a, a gra- friend's graveside, and you'll feel a tugging for something more. Like, this life is not all there is. There's something more, something beyond, something transcendent between heaven and earth. Like this world is not all there is, and we're not alone. You just, even if you're not a believer, you know there's something there. Clay Rutledge of the New York Times wrote about this recently in an article where he said that even though religious institutions are shrinking, belief in non traditional supernatural things are on the rise. Like he cited how nearly one in five Americans now believe in alien abduction, that aliens have come and robbed people and taken them back to the mothership, nearly one in five, all of whom are voters. It's very exciting if you're, if you're kind of keeping track of that. And about the same number believe they've personally seen a UFO. Like they've, they've witnessed that. Rutledge explains, he says, such ideas imply that humans are not alone in the universe, that we might be part of a larger cosmic drama. As with traditional religious beliefs, many of these paranormal beliefs involve powerful beings watching over humans, and the hope that they will rescue us from death and extinction. We just can't help ourselves. We know there's something more. So whether you're a believer or not, whether you believe in, in Christianity or not, you know there's something, that this life is not all that there is. There's something spiritual, something beyond just this life. As larger chunks of our society abandon traditional religious beliefs, as that number is going down, the non-traditional is going up because the vacuum is still there. We've got to believe in something spiritual, something more. Now let me just clear this up for you this morning from his quote. We are not alone in the universe. 
We are not. We are part of a larger cosmic drama, and there is a powerful being watching over us. He's right on all accounts, and there is absolute hope that he will rescue us from death and extinction. In fact, that is the topic of today's message, that Jesus came from God as our Savior to rescue us from death and extinction and give us great hope. You know, as a people, we're hanging on to the idea of something spiritual, even as we reject traditional religious beliefs. So my question for us this morning is it possible that maybe some of those traditional beliefs aren't accurate? Is it possible that we've been misguided about who Jesus really was, or, or worse yet, maybe we've been misled? So this morning, I want to try to look to Scripture to clear up some common misunderstandings about what it is that we celebrate this weekend, and more importantly, about where we fit in this larger story that we're trying to, to figure out and we're all part of. One of the most common misconceptions is that Jesus' disciples' lives were changed because of what they believed. So these 11 guys who were close to Jesus, they took the message of his death and his resurrection, and they literally changed the world. Today we ask people to believe in the life and the teachings of Jesus and to take that belief and allow it to change their life and the life of those around them. But the disciples' lives were not changed because of what they believed. The disciples' lives were changed because of what they saw. And that's so different. Let me show you. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. This is after Jesus' death, after his resurrection. It says, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to the disciples, and he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, you and I have to believe today based on what we've been told, on the words that we've gotten from Scripture, that we've been handed down to us and taught to us, but not the disciples. They had seen many convincing proofs that he was alive. And because of that, they had great boldness and fervor because they believed it. They saw it with their own eyes. And they used that to change the world. They were willing to die for their beliefs, and most of them did. Not because it had been handed down to them from somebody else, but because they had personally seen Jesus alive and then dead and then alive again. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about this. It says, Christ died for our sins, as the scriptures foretold. He was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. And he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. And then he was seen by James and later by all of the apostles. Now, it's really important you get this. This is one of the first passages written in the New Testament. It's written around AD 55, less than 25 years from the time that Jesus died, was crucified, buried, and rose again. Less than 25 years. Now that means that when he, Paul says many of those witnesses, those 500 who saw him all at the same time, many of them are still alive. It's like Paul was saying, go ask them yourself. Don't just take my word for it. Don't just believe what I'm saying to you. I, maybe I'm crazy. Go ask them. They saw it. They, they were there. They saw him dead and they saw him alive again. Go ask them. He makes this major point in 1 Corinthians 15 because it's so essential for our faith. He goes on a few verses later and says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is our faith. And let me just echo that. Let me echo that. If Christ is in the ground, in the Middle East somewhere, rotting away, we're all wasting our time. Go get a chocolate bunny and go home. This is, this is a waste of time, what we're doing here. We're only here. It only matters because Jesus was dead and is alive again. He says, if Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile. We're still in our sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. You know, in the early church, one of the things that was, was revolutionary about the way they did life was when someone died in the early church, they would have a huge celebration. You know, typically today, it's a lot of mourning and sadness and crying, which all makes sense, but they didn't do it typically that way in the early church. When someone would die, they would have a parade through the street and the burial, and they would celebrate. This person has been released from their bondage, and now they're at the side of, of Christ in heaven. And the world who didn't believe would look at that and say, these guys are going crazy. What's, what in the world? And Paul writes about it and says here, if, that's, if Christ is dead, then all of that's nonsense because they're just gone. They're not there anymore. But they knew it wasn't true. Because Jesus had conquered death. I'm not asking you to surrender your life to Jesus this morning because of some philosophical belief or theological teaching. I'm asking you to wrestle with historical fact that a man named Jesus from Nazarene, from Nazareth, was killed by the Romans. He was buried by Joseph of Arimathea. And then when they came to the tomb on Sunday morning, he was not there because he had risen from the dead. The disciples' lives were not changed because of what they saw or heard, the or believed or heard, that they were changed because of what they saw, a dead man who was no longer dead. He's alive. And that changes everything. 
A second misconception, I think, about our beliefs is that Jesus died and rose again to turn bad people into good people. We misunderstand that. Now, it's understandable to believe that. Jesus came to pay for our sins. Moral teaching is a big part of religious life. So it makes sense that we put two and two together and say, all right, based on that, Jesus came to turn bad people into good people. But that's not it. Let me, let me illustrate to you. My, my poor uh, children, they, they've only heard primarily one preacher their entire life, and not necessarily a, a very good preacher. That's all they've heard, really, the whole life, and that's just what they think church is about. And so every now and then, they'll hear somebody else, and it throws off everything. And so a few years ago, when they were much, much smaller, we were out of state, and we went to a, a church there, and I had a guest preacher that day, and he was a yeller. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you have been to a church where it has a, a yeller, and he was a yeller, and he was also a pointer. I mean, he, he did a lot of this thing while he was yelling, and I just can't pull that off. If, if I could, I would try that. I mean, I'm wearing a coat, for heaven's sakes. If I could yell, that's like the next step, baby steps. Right? I'll be a good preacher one of these days. I'll be able to yell and point and wear a jacket all at the same time. But they hadn't, they hadn't seen any of this, and so they were freaked out, much younger. And so they were hiding most of the time behind the pew in front of them. Kind of had their head down, partially out of boredom, partially out of fear. They were just kind of hiding down behind the, the pew. And so he was yelling, and he was trying to get everybody to come down front to repent at the end of the service. And nobody was, and so he was yelling more, trying to get them to come down front. So they got the music cranked up, and no one's coming down. And so he called, he got, you can tell he's a little ticked off by this. So he calls the music to stop and starts preaching again. You've seen this drill, right? Where they, like, round two of preaching, like the first one didn't work, we'll try this again. So shuts the music down, starts preaching a little more, and uh, he said, I need you to come down to this altar. I see you, he'd say, I need you to come down to this altar. And then I'll never forget my poor little girl's hiding behind the pew. He said, I see you there holding on to the back of that pew. Let go of that and come down to this altar. And they, they dropped their hands and put their head down, <laughs> freaked out that he had seen them, right? My poor little girls were seeing that. They just they freaked out. Now listen, if you've ever been underneath that kind of teaching and you've come to believe that Jesus came to take bad people and turn them into good people, I understand why you'd think that. I mean, it's understandable. It's just not why he came. He didn't die to, to make bad people good. Jesus died and rose again to make dead people come alive. And that's very different. Listen to Jesus' own words. In John chapter 5, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who has sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, for they have already passed from death to life. They've already passed. Not one day down the road when they get to the end of their life here. They already passed because they've given their life over to God and they've experienced the new life in Christ. You know, no matter why you're here this morning, God has plans for you. You may think it's an Easter tradition or you're just trying to appease family members or something, but you're here with God in mind. God has ideas for you. He has plans for your life. He came so that you could come to know him and experience real life, to pass over from death over into life. In Philippians chapter 3, it says, I want to know Christ, experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead, the power that raised up Jesus out of the grave, a dead man not alive. That same power is available for us. Christ wants you to experience that. So this verse really leads to two questions for me. First of all, do you know Christ? Not know about him, not know some details, not know some facts and figures of what he did, but do you know him? Are you in a relationship with God? He wants that. He came and lived and died so that not you wouldn't just know about him, but you would know him. And any relationship takes time and investment and some, some energy and thought. Are, do you know Christ? I want you to know him. I want to know him personally. And if you don't know him, you can meet him today because I want to introduce you to him. I, I'd love to, to spend some time talking that through. But then there's also this second piece. He wants us to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. So have you experienced the power of the resurrection? You know, Jesus rose from the dead in part so that you and I could experience that power. So we could pass literally from death over into life right now. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people come alive. A third misconception is that the death and resurrection of Jesus is just a powerful moment from history. Now, just to clarify, the resurrection of Jesus is a powerful moment in history, arguably the most prominent moment in history. I mean, you don't have to be a Christian to believe it. Every time you write a check and you put the date on the corner, 
You're declaring how many years it's been since Jesus was here. In the year of our Lord, 2018, you write on your check. Every, we, we all around our history is rotating around this hinge point in history when Jesus came to earth. It is a powerful moment in history, but it's not all of his story. There's more to it than that. Let me just give you an overview of the scripture for just a minute so you can kind of put it all in place. The very first words of the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. There was nothing in the beginning but God. But he had a vision. It involved you. It involved me, a dream. So he creates light, and he creates sky, and he creates the land, but still no life. And so God gets to work. He creates plants and gives them life, and trees and gives them life, and fish and gives them life, and sends them off swimming, and birds and gives them life, and sends them off flying. But he wasn't done yet. So he creates animals, a little more personal, and gives them life to them, and they go scurrying all through the forest. And then he gets more personal. and says he uses his own hands to put the dirt together and form Adam And then he gives Adam the gift, the breath of life, and breathes air into his lungs, and Adam comes alive. Centuries pass, but he's not finished. God sends Gabriel, his chief messenger, to a young Jewish girl and tells her that the gift of life is on its way again, that he's going to bring life where there was no life, that she, the virgin, will give birth to a son, the very son of God, and she will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us, because God now was with us, and he still wasn't finished. His son Jesus would bring life with him wherever he went. So wherever Jesus went, life would come. Jesus meets Jairus, whose daughter had died, and he brings life back to her dead body. He goes to Mary and Martha's house and calls their brother Lazarus out of the tomb. Death, from life from death, life where there had only been death, but he wasn't finished. The enemy throws everything at him, all kinds of death, Herod, Pilate, Judas, death, hell, the grave, but he wasn't finished. He's still not finished. Jesus brings life with him wherever he goes. You know, on Good Friday, we call it good because it's good for us. On Good Friday, we celebrate Jesus' death. Friday was full of despair and disappointment, death, pain, and loss, but he wasn't finished on Friday. He's still not finished. God brought life into a tomb that was meant only for death. I love the angel's declaration. It says, why are you looking among the dead for someone who's alive? Jesus isn't here. He has risen from the dead. You see, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people come to life, and he's still not finished. The death and resurrection of Jesus is not just a powerful moment in history. The death and resurrection of Jesus is a powerful force today because God is still not finished. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. I love the message version of this. It says, all of this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from death and set him on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe. Everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power are exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is now in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything. And at the center of all of this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world, out on the edges, The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in the center of it all, in which he speaks and acts and by which he fills everything with his presence. He is not finished, and he wants to work through you to send the power that raised him from the ground so that you and I, the church, could speak and act and fill the whole world with his presence. Because he's not done. We experience the power of resurrection as we become the church, See, we've been misled on that too. The church is not a place that we attend. The church is not a service to go to or a building to sit in. The church is a living organism which we become a part of. His body through which he speaks and acts and fills everything with his presence. And it's always been this way. If you look throughout the ages, the church has had all kinds of different ins and outs and side trips where they've not done things the right way. But for 2,000 years, the church has been united around her core teachings, her core beliefs. We're going to recite the Apostles' Creed in a moment. It was written 1,700 years ago, and its words are still true. How many things have changed in 1,700 years? Can you just picture how many things have changed in 1,700 years, and yet these statements are still the truth? The church has been united in her core beliefs, and the church has been united in her core mission 
to experience the power of the resurrection, serving the world as the body of Christ, which speaks and acts and fills everything with his presence. That's what we're calling you to today, to know Christ and experience the power of his resurrection. When Jesus was on the cross, he, he said a few different statements, short things that were so profound. His last words were three words, it is finished. It is finished. Death is finished. Despair is finished. Purposelessness is finished. It was finished, and it was, but not Jesus. Jesus was just getting started. The death and resurrection of Jesus is not just a powerful moment in history. It's more than that. It's a powerful force today if, if we'll let it and embrace it. He's come to bring life from death. And when you experience that, this is the great part, when you experience the life of Christ coming alive in you, now you won't believe because something you've heard me say or because of something you've read or because of something you've been taught. You'll believe because you've seen God working in you. Just like the disciples who didn't have to hear it and believe it, they saw it. You'll see the difference in you as he brings new life into your, into your world, into your, into your existence. The last misconception is that we're trying to build a big church. We're celebrating today because Wellspring wants to build a big church. I want to build a big church. You know, pastors get all excited about Easter, big attendances and parking problems and all that sort of thing. They get all jazzed out about that. I mean, I wore a suit for heaven's sakes. I mean, it's a big deal, you know, Easter and all of that. But the truth is, we're not here celebrating because we're trying to build a big church. I've been a small church and now a bigger church. It's a lot easier being a smaller church. We're not here to build a big church. We're celebrating today because God is trying to build you. So much of what we do here is designed because God wants to build you. The way we structure the messages, the way we provide life track, children and teen programming, God wants to build you because he's not finished yet. So I want to challenge you to, to start now. No matter what you've done, no matter what mistakes you've made or what failures you've experienced, start fresh now. Let Easter be the kickoff of a new day. Make 2018 the year that you come to know God. Not just about God, but you come to know Him. Make 2018 a year you become an active part in His body and experience His power working through your hands and your feet and your arms and legs and mouth and body. Let me introduce you to someone as we begin to wrap this up. Abbot Arnold of Kelso. Now, that's not Abbot Arnold of Kelso. I couldn't find a picture online of him, but I thought, you won't know the difference. I'll stick an old guy up there. It'll be fine. So Abbot Arnold of Kelso. Abbot Arnold of Kelso became the Bishop of St. Andrews, Scotland in November of 1160. As one of his first official acts, he called for the building of a new cathedral on the beaches of St. Andrews because the little church that was there clearly wasn't going to be enough for what God was going to do in that place. He was very confident of that. So Abbot, Abbot Arnold of Kelso began overseeing this huge construction project, and then he died quite unexpectedly less than two years later. And that was the beginning of a long run of catastrophes around the St. Andrew's Cathedral. It took them approximately 110 years to complete the cathedral, which they did in 1270. 110 years. If it takes us 110 years to build this expansion, just kill me now and bury me. I'm not going to do it. 110 years they spent on this building. So for 110 years they do the construction. It was open for two years and then a storm blew down the west wall in the year 1272. 110 years of construction, they were open for two years and they had to reconstruct again. Spent six years rebuilding that west wall and all was good for a couple of years until Scotland and England went to war in 1296 and the English army invaded and actually ripped the roof off and used the lead for their war effort and they had to rebuild again. Fast forward to the year 1378, the cathedral burned down, and they spent the next 62 years rebuilding the temple, six, the cathedral, 62 years. You think duplex has taken a long time? 62 years rebuilding this cathedral. During the 62 years, as if that wasn't enough, in 1409, the south end of the building, under a winter storm, the weight of the snow actually collapsed the south end of the building, and they had to rebuild again. And then the Scottish Reformation came. And John Knox, one of the chief protesters of the Catholic Church, came to St. Andrews, came to that cathedral in St. Andrews, and preached a series of teachings about cleansing the temple. I'm not making this up. His, his followers got so excited about cleansing the temple that they took him literally and ransacked the building, completely destroying it. And then the congregation just quit. Like they said, we've had enough. We've rebuilt too many times. 
So they quit. The church just stopped. Something broke inside of them, and they just quit rebuilding. Today, if you go to St. Andrews, the cathedral is just a tourist destination down, ro- down the road from the fancy golf course, if you know the golf course there in St. Andrews. This vision of a Christian landmark on the bay literally became rubble, and they used it as a quarry to build the other buildings around St. Andrews with the stone that was initially designed for the cathedral. This once grand vision became a broken ruin, and they just quit rebuilding. I see it all the time. A marriage gets knocked down and blown around, and at some point they just quit rebuilding. A person faces discouragement one too many times, and in their despair, disappointment, they just decide to settle, and they quit rebuilding. The grand vision of God in our life becomes the broken ruin of regret, and we just quit rebuilding. Easter is a celebration of the truth that Jesus has not quit on us. He's not quit on you. He's still in the business of rebuilding. And he wants to build me, and he wants to build you. He declared that he's going to make everything new, and he is. So no matter what you've done or how you've failed, God wants to know you. God wants you to experience the power of the resurrection in your life because he wants to build you and rebuild you to this grand vision he had. And Easter, Easter offers us a fresh start, a new beginning, a new day. I don't want any of us to leave this building today without inviting God into our life, or at least inviting him into a greater level to make us a new person. He came to rescue us. So if you don't know the Lord, let's talk. I would love to introduce him to you. I'd love to spend some time talking about your objections and looking at the Bible together. If you've never pledged your life to Christ in baptism, we could celebrate that with you today. We could do that today or this week. Let's make that a priority. Because it's Easter... It would just be logical for me to end today to talk about Christmas. I don't really understand why, but I didn't know what else to say, so I just, you know, it's logical. So we're going to celebrate Christmas for just a minute. Why do we celebrate Christmas? Anybody know on the 25th? Well, we don't know when Jesus was born, and like anything, you could look online and find multiple stories, but here's the one I've been told that makes the most sense. Scripture doesn't tell us, so it's just history and things. And the Bible, you know, Scripture didn't, outside of Scripture, there wasn't a lot of details about when Jesus was born and all of that. So church historians, years after the fact, were really enamored with John the Baptist's words about Jesus, where he said, Jesus must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. So the church historians, years down the road, said, let's, let's set a date for when Jesus was born. We'll celebrate that one date, and let's put it on the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, so that starting with the birth of Jesus, every day will start getting longer and longer in honor of his birth. It's a kind of a cool picture. Turns out they got the date wrong. December 21st is the winter solstice. Hey, but this this is a long time ago. Let's give them a break, right? So that was the day that was supposed to be Christmas. is December 25th. So then why is New Year's Day the new year on January 1st? There's no astrology reason, no scientific reason. The first day we see January 1st as being used by any nation was the the Romans in, in 45 B.C., but over the years, they didn't get really unanimous consent there. The Romans did that. Other nations did other days. There's no universal New Year's like there is today until the 1500s. And Pope Gregory, a follower of Christ, issued the Gregorian calendar, which united the world around this one calendar and this one day, January 1st, as New Year's Day. And part of it was to celebrate the life of Jesus. So why January 1st? Well, if December 25th was when we were celebrating that he was born, January 1st would be his eighth day. And what happened to little Jewish baby boys on the eighth day? Two things. One is they would be named. Jewish babies weren't named on day one. They were named on the eighth day. And they'd also, baby boys would be circumcised on the eighth day. So on the eighth day, on January 1st, they would have given him the name of Jesus and they would have circumcised him. On January 1st, his eighth day, they would have given him the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, and they would have shed his blood for the first time on that eighth day. And so on that eighth day, January 1st, we universally call for a new beginning, a fresh start. Everything is possible because of the name of Jesus and everything is possible because he shed his blood for us. Now as cool as that is, I think that makes more sense for today. So I want to ask you to start now and make this a new year. Make 2018 the year that you 
come to know God, not just about Him, but know Him. And may 2018, the year you become an active part in His body, the church, make Easter today a new beginning. I'll give New Year's Day to Jenny Craig and Planet Fitness. They can have that day. This day's for you. This day is the day that you start fresh because Easter calls for more. Easter reminds us that new life is here. Everything in our world right now screams this out. The birds chirp it. The buds in the trees declare it. Every freaking dandelion in my yard screams it out. New life is here. New life, a fresh beginning. It's all for you. And God wants you to take that new moment, that fresh start, and come to know him. He died so it could happen. But he's no longer dead. Let's pray together. God, I ask you to, to show yourself to us, God. I ask you that you would show us your life. You would show us a new beginning and a fresh start. God, no matter what we've been through, no matter what we've experienced, no matter what failures we've had, we give this moment to you. We present ourselves to you as a fresh beginning. And we ask, God, that you would not only show us yourself, that we would come to know you, but we ask that you would give us a fresh start, a new beginning, that we experience the power that raised you to life, raising and changing our life. Church, just give him, um, in your own words, give him your struggles, yourself, your concerns, your doubts, your fears. Hand those over to him. Present those to him today and allow him to bring new life to you. Pray and then I'll, I'll pray in just a moment.